So uh, I, I'm going to wrap up the Everything on the Table series that we've been in, and I'm, I'm pivoting towards Lent. I, I heard a, a joke that I greatly appreciated that, you know, uh, we, we had Ash Wednesday this week, or as Baptists call it, Wednesday. <laughs> um, you know, often, <laughs> William gets it, um, often in evangelical churches, we, we don't make a big deal about these traditional, you know, holidays, but they really matter. Um, they really help us set a rhythm and a pattern to our lives where otherwise I feel we might be just tossed and turned by the news cycles or the other things that might pull on us. It, it, it's really good. So um, there, there's really two things I follow. I try to follow Lent and we follow the Advent. And, and those have given my life so much of a framework to see the Lord move in some wonderful ways that I, I need. And when I think whenever the, the world feels so out of control, um, it's that anchor point, it's that foundation, you know, that, that we know what's going to come, we know what we can do with this, and the Lord meets us there. Um, I fasted for uh, Ukraine and this whole situation, and every time I fast, it's, it's a powerful experience. And I, 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 I don't know why, all right? This is my theological analysis of, of, of fasting. It works. <laughs> uh, that, that's as far as I go with it, because I, every time I finish a fast, I always think, why don't I do this more often? Because it's such a powerful time to encounter the Lord, to hear him clearly, to, to get rid of distraction, and to just say, Lord, I'm coming to, to you. I'm saying no to something and turning towards you. And, and that's what really is, I think, the heart of Lent, to saying no to things and turning to, towards the Lord and saying yes to him. You, I don't know that we can actually say yes to everything in life. In fact, I'll tell you, we, we can't. You have to say no. Um, we can't say yes to everything that comes our way. They, they made a movie about that, yes guy, or yes man, not a recommendation. But, <laughs> but you know, we, we have this idea that maybe life would be great if we just said yes to everything that came our way, and, and we can't. We'll run out of money. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll run out of hearts. We'll run out of love. We'll run out of time and attention. We'll be exhausted. We have to, to choose and prioritize things in life. And, and that, that's a kind of an unfortunate part of growing up and, and handling these things, that saying yes to something means saying no to something else. And so when we choose and Lent to say yes to the Lord, may we see a whole lot more of his kingdom come. Um, we've talked a about a lot in this series. I, I hope you've gotten something out of this. We talked about putting our expectations on the table and idols, hidden idols, disappointments. I talked about the, the white sheet that, that uh, we had a vision of where we talked about putting our righteousness on the table, our identity, our unbelief, all of these things we talked about putting on the table. So now to kind of bring that all together in a, a different way, let, let me ask you right now, all right, you can, you can take this up with the Lord if you want. What's the oldest thing in your fridge right now? <laughs> you can think about it. You don't have to answer it out loud. I, I, I'm ashamed to tell you. Um, yeah, don't, don't Google dirty fridges. They're, they're actually kind of gross. Um, there's some really nasty fridges out there. And Leah would be so upset if this was actually a picture of ours. This is not our fridge. But we found recently a, a, a bottle of salad dressing that was before COVID-19 that expired before COVID-19. I won't tell you how long before <laughs> COVID-19 <laughs> it expired. You know, but you s just start thinking, I'm pretty sure vinegar doesn't go bad, right? I'm pretty sure this will be fine. <laughs> you know, it's that thing that falls behind the juice and gets on that ledge behind there. And, you know, you don't see it for a few months. You forget it's there. Then eventually you're going through there trying to find something and you come across this thing and you look at it and you go, Ooh, <laughs> and you just feel embarrassed all of a sudden, at least I do, right? Of like, oh my goodness, I'm living in filth. What, what have I done to my family? What, what am I doing here? Um, so what's on your back shelf that we can put on the table? Um, last time that I, I spoke to you in the series, I, I briefly mentioned the Wesley quadrilateral. Um, kind of looks like a table. All right, this is not going to be on the test. You don't have to know this, but this, this is a, a framework for understanding that comes from the, mainly the, the Methodists and Wesley, though actually it's not John Wesley, fun fact. Um, but it's attributed to him. But it's these ideas of this is what they brought to the core of their faith, saying that these things can come to the table. These are the things that, that can give us an understanding of, of theology and the scripture. Like when we bring all of this to the table, 
we begin to have some framework for understanding <laughs> spirituality and life and my own journey and all these things. And scripture, of course, makes perfect sense, right? We want to bring that to the table and understand it. You know, tradition, eh, I mean, we're vineyard, you know. <laughs> Our traditions go back to the 80s, maybe in the earliest. We can't have many old traditions. Reason, I mean, we love our apologetics and our theologians, right? Of course, we want to bring that to the table. But experiences starts to feel a little dangerous. It starts to feel a little bit like, whoa, whoa. Is that something we can actually bring and account for by the glory of God? Is this, is, is this something that can inform and bring my faith to the next place where the Lord is leading me? Can I bring this to the table, or do we have to, in shame, kind of leave it on the back shelf? Leave that for another day, saying, I, I, I don't know that we can actually trust to go here. Depending on how you grew up, reasons, iffy, tradition might be, but this is what Wesley said. Or again, not Wesley, but what's attributed to him. The living core of the Christian faith was revealed and scriptured, illuminated by tradition, vivified in personal experience, and confirmed by reason. And I think the big thing when I came across this that really occurred to me is my experiences can be considered valid. They can be accounted for. I, I don't have to kind of leave them at the door and be like, well, it's going to be all faith from this moment on. You know, like I'm, I'm going to leave those things that maybe cause questions and strife and, and, and problems and doubt. I'm going I'm to leave that behind and just say, forget that. Forget that and let's just focus on the things that I know. And what this is really saying is bring it before the Lord. Bring it to the kingdom of God. Let his light illuminate your very real lived experiences. And if you're like me, I'm not projecting that everybody is, that might feel unsettling because we've put certain things on the back shelf. Just think, thinking, I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> I, I don't know how to handle that. I don't know where the Lord was then. I don't know anything about this, but I'm going to circle back to that one day. Often we have experiences that work well experiences that confirm our thinking and our understanding, our theology, but sometimes we don't. You know, Melissa, when she spoke here a few weeks ago, she talked about disappointments. More than that, sometimes we just experience mystery, things we don't know what to do with. Sometimes it's just a sense of other. There's something else going on here, and I can't quite put my finger on it, and I'm just going to put that on my back shelf. I'm not sure how to judge them. I'll think about it later. And this is how disappointments often get processed. We get hurt, we get angry, we get disillusioned, and we just stuff it down. My, my parents, my, my dad actually had, I, I, he might be embarrassed for me to say this out loud, he put on our fridge, stuff it, <laughs> stuff it down. This is kind of the, the English way of handling your emotions, right? We just put on a brave face, ignore these things for right now, and then what happens, right, is over a period of time, what you've stuffed down grows bigger and bigger and bigger, then all of a sudden it erupts. And you got anger and confusion and frustration. You don't even know where it came from. Because the thing is, it's not about the fact that the scooter was left in the driveway. It's about the fact that for 20 years, I haven't known how to handle these things. And we've stunted our emotional health. We've stunted our spiritual direction because we refuse to bring our experiences and our life to the saving grace of the Lord. So the things on the back shelf are meant to come and to be confronted by the reality of who God is and what he's doing. So much of what I, I want us to get through this Lenten season, season is the idea of moving forward, dealing with these things. Not leaving things for another day, but realizing that this is the day that the Lord has made. That this is the time, this is the, the moment of encounter where all that I have, I give to you, Lord. Where all that you've given to me, I give back to you in praise. So, Let's jump into this a little bit with questions. I'm going to get at reason a little bit here. Leah talked about unbelief. So what do we do about the Nephilim in Scripture? <laughs> what do we do about the council in heaven where Satan came and reported to God what he's been up to? <laughs> William's got some ideas. What do we do about the fact that, that God gave a message to Daniel, but it arrives 21 days later? It was delayed because it was in a wrestling match with the prince of the kingdom of Persia. What do we do with that? Do you... Do you pray about these things often, or do you kind of say, that's an interesting scripture? I'll come back to that later. <laughs> and that's not even getting into women in ministry, LGBTQ, politics and religion, the use of spiritual gifts, tongues, healing. We could go on and on and on about all these things that well-meaning Christians often put a pin in and say, 
I'll come back to that later. The thing is, church, I believe we are meant to wrestle. This, this isn't a sidebar. Wrestling with Scripture, wrestling with the Lord, trying to come to terms with this, trying to deal with this very real world and the questions we have looking at Scripture and the fact that our souls cry out saying, I know it shouldn't be like this. You know that feeling? That's the Christian walk. It's not an exception. It's the reality of what we're called to. We're called to wrestle with the Lord and wrestle with this world until things start to make sense, until we begin to see his kingdom come and we begin to see from his point of view rather than our own. You remember what Israel means? The word Israel means God wrestler. <laughs> so when you become a Christian, when we've been grafted into the, the, the tree of Israel, it's like a tag team in the wrestling match. <laughs> That's really what it is. As Christians, we've been tagged in to this long story of people wrestling with this, of saying, Lord, we want a king. Like, like all these other nations have kings. Why don't we have a king? We want a human we can look to. And God's like, that's going to be a wrestling match. They're like, we want this. And he concedes. He lets you have it. Then what happens? All things break out. And there's divided kingdoms. And there, there's slavery. And there's all this brokenness and exile. and exile. All of these things happen. And we're wrestling through it, saying, Lord, let your kingdom come. Lord, let your will be done. Melissa said that when we wrestle with God, we grow in intimacy because it's a profoundly intimate experience. We treat questions and doubts sometimes like the enemy or, or the plague. But I love, 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 as Leah talked last week about how the Lord met with Thomas. You know, I, I think growing up as a Christian, I, I thought doubts were shameful things. I thought there were things to be avoided. I, I thought that I shouldn't speak that out loud. Have you ever read the Psalms? <laughs> Some of the Psalms come dangerously close to calling God a liar, saying, God, where were you? God, what is happening? This isn't what you promised me. This isn't what I understand. When I look at Scripture, where is this? And it's this wrestling match and yet a resolution, but I will praise you. And when Thomas struggled, when Thomas was asking, you know, can it actually be true? This has never happened. Yeah, I can't fault Thomas for saying, you think he was resurrected? <laughs> like, this is a new thing. Lord, I need to see, I need to know. And, and the Lord graciously and lovingly sought him out, invited him in, that his experience would match what he was called to see and understand. The truth does not mind being questioned. The truth does not mind being questioned. A lie does not like being challenged. All right? The truth does not mind being questioned. A lie does not like being challenged. So we've been tag team into this wrestling match. This isn't just for some and not for others. If we're going somewhere with God, if we're going somewhere that matters, okay, I think that that's maybe the thing, right? If when we get serious about our faith, when we actually want to go someplace, when we actually want it to, to matter to our, ourselves and not be some inner peace and some future hope, <laughs> but when my faith is for today and when it's for this world that's, that's broken, there has to be wrestling. If we're dying to self, if we're repenting, it's not just a thing that's done to us. It's something that engages us, our emotions, our flesh, our past. So if we're continuing, if we're growing, it's wrestling. Water over time, you know, breaks down rocks. You, you just have that Chinese water torture thing of, of dropping water on rocks and the rocks break down. But the human body, if it needs to become stronger, muscles get torn down, they have to come back stronger. That's the path ahead. A lot of this is going back to Melissa's sermon. If you haven't heard it, go back and listen to it. Character is developed, not imparted. But I said this last time too. Many of us would prefer a God who no longer speaks and can be readily understood to a God who is beyond us, who calls us, who challenges us, who confounds us with mystery. It's not safe. It's not safe to have a God he was so far beyond our understanding that you actually cannot understand him. It's frustrating at times. It really is. I'll tell you, like the, the more you think you understand God and then he shows up and you're like, I know nothing. And I've been doing this for 20, 30, 40 years. Dear Lord, aren't I better than this now? Do, shouldn't I have this down by now? And it's still a wrestling, it's still something. And then it gets to that point where all you can do is drop to your knees and say, but you are God and I am not but yet I still trust you, even though he slay me. And when we see that in scripture, then all of a sudden, it's like, oh my goodness. <laughs> I've been fighting this all along, 
And it's a call to worship. It's a call to celebrate. It's a call to give myself to something greater than myself. And what a wonderful story that actually can be. Some of you are too capable. <laughs> You're too smart. I don't know if you have these kids sometimes who are too smart for their own good. You know, you can just see devious little things coming where you realize how clever they are, you know. And then sometimes we have children, too, who, like, play hide-and-go-seek by, like, standing in the corner <laughs> with their back turned to you. Sometimes you, you see something, sometimes you see another thing. But the thing is, a lot of us have back-shelved our abilities or our disabilities because of what we think we're called to be or what we're not called to be. Some of us, I think, are toiling away in, in some arenas where we're good enough and we're appreciated enough, but it isn't what you've been called to do. We play it safe because we get uncomfortable with the idea of risk. So we put on the back shelf who we are and what I can do because do I really want to try? I'm, I'm doing okay as I am right now. And, and, and maybe if I do something more, something stronger, something bolder, maybe I'd be embarrassed. I, I don't know that I've met many people, truly, my entire life, who are beyond the point of embarrassment, right? We still have this, this part in our souls that feels shame. And we, we think we grew out of this in our, our high school years, but then something can happen. All of a sudden, we feel shame still. We're embarrassed. And it's Adam and Eve back in the garden. It's this idea of don't look at me. It's this idea of, you know what, I, I'm, it's just safe here. I'm just not going to try that again. And our lives become more and more narrow because we forget what it is to actually risk, to try to learn, to try to be something more than what we've accepted in our lives. I hear this so much that people want their calling to be like a puzzle piece, right? I, I have too many kid shows. I, 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 I don't know if you've got girls, if you can relate to this, but you've got My Little Pony and, and Tinkerbell. I, brief aside, there is a picture for this one where we've got, you know, the cutie marks on the My Little Ponies. I didn't know this until I think Ava, and Ava helped me see this in, in some of the My Little Pony. As soon as they discover their identity, like who they're meant to be, their cutie mark appears. It's like this magic thing. Tinkerbell, when it, they had all these little things that like, you know, figure out what the, the, the fairies are going to be about. And as soon as she touched the hammer, because she's a tinker fairy, it glows. And the thing is, I think this pollutes our thinking. That we believe that when the Lord's called me to do something, it's going to be like lightning striking. It's going to be like all of a sudden, bam, everything's clear, and I know exactly who I am in the kingdom of God, and everything's going to work that way. And we don't risk. We don't try, and we don't fail. And we don't learn, and we don't grow. We forget what it is to be the lesser in this relationship to what God has called us to be. We forget that being a disciple means starting as the fumbling guy who knows nothing and putting it into practice and trying and saying, Lord, I tried to cast out that demon. Why didn't it work? I got to fast and pray. Okay, let's try this again. And there, there's no glowing hammer. There's, there's no marks that appear in our body saying like, oh, you're a prophet. Oh, you've got, you've got the gift of tongues. Oh, you can heal. We try. We struggle. We wrestle. And I, th I think there are sometimes, yes, where people just seem to like magic, it just kind of works. That may happen for some. I will tell you, the vast majority, the vast majority that I know, you have to work at preaching. You have to work at teaching. You have to work at understanding scripture. You have to work at disciple making. You have to work at prayer. The Lord taught them how to pray. These are things you try, you struggle, you fail, and you get better at as you do it. And this idea of, of thinking it's just going to happen for me, like it's my innate talents that's just going to come through, I think is a damaging thought. I think it, it keeps us from actually trying to be who the Lord's called us to be. I, I'm this perfectionist in a nasty way, because if I can't do it well, I don't want to do it because I don't want to be embarrassed. And so it's procrastination and laziness and shame and all this stuff together. You know, you, you think about the people that, that like, if I'm not good at something, I'm going to try it harder and get better at this thing. Well, that's some people. <laughs> some of us think, Maybe not. Maybe it's good enough that I do the things that I do well, and I won't try to do anything else. Frank DeFord is a sports writer. He talks about how we've lost amateur sport. 
because everything's going for professional. Everything, you have to be in club soccer. You have to be on a traveling team. You have to get a private coach to work you through the off season. Because if you don't do that, then the next time you're on the field, it's just chaos. Because these other kids are spending, you know, tens of thousands of dollars trying to get better because their parents believe that they're going to be, you know, the, the next Messi or whatever it's going to be. And you get the, this crazy competitive world where we've lost what sport is about. We've lost it in America. Because all it's about is this end glory. All it's about is this end picture. And we've lost what we're actually about when we're out there on the field, enjoying the time with our friends, when we're actually stretching ourselves and trying and having a good time with that. It's pay to play, and it's choking sport out of the games our kids play. Because they have to be on a club or travel. I, I threaten my daughter sometimes that I'm going to start a YouTube channel <laughs> called Josh Does Things Badly. Um, I, I think it might be a good idea that... <laughs> This is for me to get over myself. Here's, this is actually, this is not my, my first thing, but if you look at this next picture I have here, my, my dad shared this on Facebook. That's a portrait of him by one of his college friends. And, and this is what the guy wrote about this. This is number 15 in the pandemic series in honor of Jim's pandem pandemic hairstyle. He says, in early 2019, I decided to try and do something artistic that was out of my skill set. The reason that I decided to do that was to try to become to grips with my tendency to be overly concerned with others' opinions. I thought that if I could be brave putting unartistic art out to be seen, I could desensitize my concerns. So I decided to paint portraits. It was intended to be a shame exercise. I kind of love that. So on the, on the right-hand side, those are the croissants I made <laughs> with carrots, but I was going to take all of it myself. So we said, all right, let's, let's, I'm going to do croissants. These were somewhere between muffins and biscuits and... <laughs> I, I don't know what we did wrong exactly, but the answer is probably a lot. <laughs> and, and they were overcooked on the bottom, undercooked over here. The next batch came out better, but, but we actually still have some of those croissants at home if anybody would like to try some of those. <laughs> something, yeah, in the back of the fridge. There was something holy, though, about bringing these to the table. There was something holy in doing this with my daughter. There's something sacramental about this. I, I, I touched a part of my life that I haven't touched in years, making these croissants, all right? And I think there's something so important for us in this. I'm not going to read the story of Gideon. Um, it's in Judges 6 or 8. You can read it. Mark Twain tells us a story about a man searching for the world's greatest general. The man searched his whole life until one day he died. He met St. Peter at the pearly gates man told St. Peter that he was looking for the world's greatest general. And St. Peter said he could help. So he led the man to another inhabitant of heaven. And by the way, this is not a true story, just in case you're wondering. I don't think this is how this works. But he, he led the man to another inhabitant of heaven and introduced him as the world's greatest general. The man who had been searching replied, that's not the world's greatest general. That, that man was a cobbler that was on Main Street in, in my hometown. And St. Peter responded, but had he been a general, he would have been the greatest general ever. There's something about that story that always kills me. You know, the, the life unlived. The, the things we haven't tried, the things we haven't risked in this world or in the kingdom of God because we've been too ashamed, too fearful. We've, we've kept things on the back shelf. We've played things safe. Gideon is this man who is actually uh, threshing wheat in a wine press. I'm no farmer or vintner, but I know that those two things aren't the same. You, you don't thresh wheat in a wine press. He did it because he was afraid. He did it because he was fearful. And an angel shows up and says, Gideon, all right, good so far. The Lord be with you. That's a nice welcome. Mighty warrior. <laughs> and at that point in time, this fearful man hiding from others is called mighty warrior. And the Lord gives him a task. He says, go and, 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 and get rid of the, 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 the idols that are in your house. Go ahead and clear this land of all this idolatry that you have. So Midian, under the cover of night, <laughs> goes and, and secretly does what he was told to do. And everyone's like, what happened to our idols? Fear and shame. And Gideon grew through this. Gideon grew through this. And then we get to the point, too, where we know that he doubted it so much he put out the fleece and all sorts of stuff and, and he led a, an army with smaller and smaller people because he began to trust the Lord more and more and more. Gideon had fear. Gideon had theological arguments. This is what he said. If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? 
where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord's abandoned us and given us into the hands of Midian. That's in your Bible. That's what this mighty judge Gideon thought. God has abandoned us. I don't even know if he moves anymore. You tell me these stories, that doesn't line up with my shared life experience. Where is this God? Where, where are we going with this whole thing? I personally have put Russia on the back shelf. I studied Russian in college, believing I was going to be a missionary to Russia. I got involved with the Triangle Vineyard in Raleigh because the first week that we went there, among many other things, the first week we went there, I heard about a Russian church plant in Nizhny Novgorod. It was in 2001. College was a few years before that. That was a long time ago. It's getting longer as, I <laughs> as the older I live. It was on my back shelf. It's behind that old jar of pickles that expired behind that hidden, hidden valley ranch. But it was never settled in my soul. I prayed about Russia. I determined about Russia in 2019. I finally went to Russia in 2019. I went to Russia and pow, COVID hit. <laughs> and pow, the, the leader of the Russian partnership resigns and all of a sudden Leah and I are leaving the Vineyard Russian partnership. And pow, now we've got war. It wasn't just waiting for it to happen. I, I think, you know, these, these are the cliffs notes of these stories. And we think, oh, what, what a great thing that the Lord brought this timing about. Well, let me tell you a little bit behind the scenes about how this actually worked. Like I could tell that story and you can think, the Lord called us to Russia and here we are. We're going ahead. Everything's great. But I was in a dark night of my soul. I was in a dark night of my soul. I was struggling with what I believed and what I saw. I was struggling with my own hurt and things that were done to me and, and church. There's no hurt like church hurt, y'all. There, 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 there's nothing like a theological stab in the heart and the soul that you just think, what do I do with this? You know, Lord, where are you? And it's hard and painful as we work through this. And so I, w I was trying to figure out what in the world I was going to do. I've been a pastor for so long. I, I believe this stuff and, and I had questions and doubts and fears and struggles and things that I hoped for hadn't happened and all this stuff. And I was at a national conference. There was a sign that said, why not Russia? Like, why not now? <laughs> and it wasn't this faith-filled stirring of my soul. It was a last stab of hope. I'm thinking, okay, maybe, <laughs> maybe. I put a toe out there and it just started, my soul started singing. And I had a conversation with him, and I just was coming into life again. And then I went, and I walked the streets, and I broke in tears because the Lord had called me to this. And it was on my back shelf for so long that I had almost forgotten. Almost forgotten. I didn't want to risk. I didn't want to try. I had a job. I have a—you know, all, all the stuff that life is calling me to do. How could I possibly add one more thing? But my soul— wouldn't be silent on this. The more that I reached out, the more that I started, the more that I knew the Lord was in this. And that's the story behind the scenes. The hammer didn't glow. <laughs> it took a faithful stepping out and risking and trying. You know, the, 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 the time zone differences, the jet lag, the length of the trips, when you have a nine to five job like I do, that is a challenging thing to, to go halfway across the world where it's going to take you two, three, four, five days to get over the jet lag, even be close to the same time zone. And I don't speak the language. I should have spent the last 19 years studying Russian, but I didn't. <laughs> These are the challenges and God is above it all. That dark night of the soul is what brought the emphasis on the table. Cultivating joy, which you've heard us talk about came through that dark night of the soul. It's possible, church, to grow old and to not grow up. It's possible for life to happen to you rather than you live it intentionally. This is dangerously close, I think, to sounding like self-help psychology. But church, let me tell you, we're plagued by this in the church. This is a spiritual malady that's affecting us. Because Jesus came to give life and life to the full. Few people really get this. I, I don't really count myself among them. Life and life to the full is a profound statement. Romans 4.17, I've made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. He calls Gideon a warrior when he was not. He called Abraham a father when he was not. He called me to Russia when I wasn't there. 
Proverbs 13, 12, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. And later on in the same chapter, a longing fulfilled is sweet to the soul, but fools detest turning from evil. The Lenten idea here, again, of turning from one thing to the other. We have to turn away from uh, the, the, the stuff that, that we don't know how to deal with. We have to turn away from our own shame. We have to turn away from fear. We have to turn away from, from even safety sometimes into risk. We have to turn from this world to the kingdom of God, and it's going to be light shining in darkness. It's going to be confrontation of these things that, you know what, might not look like we think. Your first thing of croissants might taste more like biscuits. That's okay. This is where we go. This is how we do it. It's going to be like a discipline. It's going to be like work. It's going to be like a wrestling match. That's the call. People waste their lives. This is the sad, hard truth, right? Christians waste their lives, their time, their passion. There's no guarantee of a well-lived, intentional life. When you sign up to become a Christian, God doesn't take over your faculties and coerce you into his fate where all of a sudden everything's sunshine and, and roses, Look at the old kings of Israel. With every advantage, how many of them stayed the course? Did God want them to fail? No. A squeaky wheel gets the grease, but, you know, you're not a wheel. Sometimes we're not squeaking. Sometimes we're growing silent. We're still. We're not a machine. So we have to tend to our back shelf. We have to prune. We have to turn over the soil in the off-season. Victor Hugo is one of my favorites. He, he says this, short as life is, we make it still shorter by the careless waste of time. Oof. Scripturally, it says this, Psalm 90, teach us to number each of our days so that we may grow in wisdom. Lord, remind me of how brief my time on earth will be. This is from Psalm 39. Remind me that my days are numbered, how fleeting my life is. You have made my life no longer than the width of my hand. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you. At best, each of us is but a breath. Ephesians. So be very careful how you live. Do not live like those who are not wise, but live wisely. Use every chance you have for doing good, because these are evil times. Do not be foolish, but learn what the Lord wants you to do. Again, in Ephesians, don't waste your time on useless work, mere busy work. The barren pursuits of darkness expose these things for the sham they are. You know our Bible is so rich. <laughs> it tells you to not play Candy Crush. Did you know that that was in Scripture? Did <laughs> we live in a world that doesn't know peace and prosperity. We know toil and longing. And frankly, we get lazy. We get bored. We get burdened. We get stuck. We lose passion don't know what to do when there's no taskmaster breathing down our necks and when our to-do list is done. Mechanics of living are more compelling than what we have to do with our lives. The last thing I want to share for you is Psalm 122. Th th this is the, the pivot point into Lent, and I know that time's gotten away from me here. But you've got two sermons in one. You've, you've got the end of everything on the table, and you get Lent. So, you know, hey. So, Psalm 122. I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. That is where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to praise the name of the Lord according to the statute given to Israel. There stand the thrones for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls security within your citadels. For the sake of your family and of my family and friends, I will say, peace be with you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. That word prosperity gives me chills because I think of prosperity gospel. And I think, oh no, like, what is this? About? Is it only about the well-lived life that, that looks like richness in this world? Is it only about finances? Like, what, what is this saying? That word, shavla, I had to look it up in the Hebrew. It's not the same thing as like insurance policies or bank accounts or stockpiles of weapons. It's, its root is in leisure. The relaxed stance of one who knows everything is all right because God is with us. He's over us. He's for us. That's prosperity. That's a well-lived life. Prosperity has such baggage in English, but it's so powerful here in the Psalms. I'm going to make this Lent journey into the heart of God as deep calls unto deep. 
You can join with me. You can make croissants. I'll, I'll bring them to the table and we can enjoy biscuity croissants together. For every no that you say, make sure you find a yes. For every turning away, make sure you are turning towards. The hammer doesn't have to glow for this to be from the Lord. You don't have to get some birthmark to appear on your left butt cheek to say, I found my calling. I know who I'm meant to be. But I believe, I believe there's a part in your soul that will come alive. And as we see here, let us go to the house of the Lord and you sing in worship because you've got peace and prosperity and your soul knows this is who I was meant to be. And you might fumble, you might stumble, it might be embarrassing, you might not want to risk it. Your soul will be led by the Lord, whether through green pastures or through the valley of the shadow of death. You will know that the Lord is your God. Gideon had to go to war. You have to count the cost and you have to pay it. I'm going to close with this one line here. We, we, we talk about not being about programs in this church. We talk about being about presence instead. We talk about not being concerned about size but purpose, about not going uh, wide, but we want to go deep. The church can be so busy sometimes trying to keep the lights on that we forget why. We forget what it is that constitutes who we are in opposition to what the world tells us we should be or could be. The things that God has called us to, the things that make our souls come alive and celebrate. Let's find that. And it's different. That's the beauty of it. What makes my soul come alive and sing? I don't expect everybody here to join with me going to Russia, but you're welcome to. But you have a gift and a calling and a purpose. And if you've got this on your back shelf, if you've neglected it, this is the season. I, I, I mean that. This is the season to find what makes you alive, what gives you purpose and intentionality, what the Lord has gifted to you that he cannot gift anybody else. Let's pray.